in all the years that Backlash has existed, the sole purpose of it was to make it a WrestleMania Revenge type pay-per-view, and anybody could easily understand that just by looking at the name Backlash. But for whatever reason, WWE decides to slap the WrestleMania name onto it in a desperate attempt at getting more viewers. Putting WrestleMania on any pay-per-view aside from WrestleMania itself is absolute laziness. Here are 20 sins to start us off. Also, that one awkward moment where the main event of WrestleMania Backlash is a match whose feud never existed even after WrestleMania went off the air last month. More reasons as to why we'd be better off to just refer to this event as Backlash. The biggest stage. Narration. Also, Dave Batista is involved with this pay-per-view event more frequently than we thought he would, narrating the opening video package, then sending some zombies from Army of the Dead to invade the show. Found myself a target a few times. You know, this is all we needed to promote Batista's next movie. Show some references to the zombies while relating them to current situations in WWE. Targets on your back, survival by any means necessary. That's all we had to do. Backlash is coming. Ha! <laughs> Giggity! You are looking live! This is literally the only pay-per-view in WWE history where I'm placing a sin for Adnan Virk. As much as he's accomplished in sports, being a commentator for professional wrestling is a completely different world with a different type of experience required. And sadly, Adnan had none of those. As if Adnan Virk's commentary wasn't bad enough, now he's given Byron Saxton a new nickname by calling him B-Sax. Please don't ever call him that again, it doesn't sound good at all. A triple threat right out of the game. Oh my god, here we go. Apparently the match for the Raw Women's Championship coming up next is referred to as a triple threat, according to Adnan Virk. What on earth is that? It was taken from me! Charlotte Flair is acting like Rhea Ripley herself took her unofficial WrestleMania match against Asuka away from her. I can honestly understand Charlotte getting an opportunity here because COVID-19 was the culprit of her absence. But here she blames Rhea Ripley who was not at fault whatsoever. Although, Charlotte's inclusion to this match was done in an extremely horrible way that gets five sins. She challenges Asuka to a non-title match, she loses that match, gets pissed off, assaults the referee, gets fined and suspended, and then Sonya Deville grants her a title match the following week with no continuation of the suspension because... not even reasons. Karma is a bitch. I'm gonna call Awesome Kong and tell her what you said about her, Charlotte. The fact that we literally hear the words do it again when it comes to Charlotte being added to matches really shows how frequent this has been going on since 2018. And I take what's given. Well, from the sounds of that, WWE gives unnecessary title matches away more than a regular person hands out candy to children on Halloween. Rhea Ripley's non-pyro pyro. And what a shame too, she actually had pyrotechnics for a while. Why not tonight? If Charlotte forces Asuka to submit, if Asuka makes Charlotte- Okay, yes, we know. Rhea Ripley can lose the title without getting involved. One example is annoying enough, but Corey Graves is making sure we hear all the examples. Every time the Raw Women's Championship is won in a triple threat, oh. Charlotte Flair is involved- That either shows how infrequent the Raw Women's title is defended in triple threats, or how sad it is that Charlotte Flair is always involved in every single one of them. Both are surprising sins. Oh, Asuka and Rhea Ripley briefly team up to go after Charlotte Flair, but the moment Rhea tries to go for the victory, Asuka is offended and doesn't understand why Rhea would do that. Asuka out of the ring. Oh. I'm not denying that this definitely hurt Asuka, but oh my god, Charlotte slowed down as if she was a car stopping with the light turned red. Quickly paced on preparing Asuka for the suplex, but then hit the slowest attempt possible. The most experienced. One would think that Charlotte, someone who is looking to achieve her 14th women's title, would actually know better than to taunt in the champion's face literally two minutes into the match when everybody is fresh. Man, we're not off to a good start so far. Also, nearly a full minute of Charlotte and Rhea Ripley taunting each other while Asuka recovers on the outside of the ring. Charlotte tells Asuka that she'll never beat her, despite the fact that Asuka has actually defeated Charlotte on multiple occasions. That phrase only works if Asuka never did beat Charlotte ever. More moments of bullshit. There are no disqualifications in a triple threat match, so what's the fucking point of breaking the submission hole when the wrestlers reach the ropes? No disqualifications means no rope breaks. Unleashing the brutality. Ha ha, fuck you. What is going through the mind? You already know the answer to what's going through the queen's mind. Corey Graves would be great at CinemaSins 2 expansion. It's pretty obvious that once a wrestler sees their opponents outside the ring, the first thing to pop up is, I'm gonna perform a high risk maneuver on them. I must say, Charlotte Flair is very impressive on the moonsault she performs in matches. The problem is, she just never seems to actually connect a single one of them on her opponents. Pretty much every time she either lands in between them or behind them. Well, it might make good on her Wrestler who successfully hits a high risk move the first time tries to repeat it and fails the second time, cliche. Two's a company, three's a crowd! <sighs> and I thought Mauro Ranallo making references were cringe. Adnan Verk officially takes that position now. 
Apparently that double suplex was somehow intense enough to require a full screen replay instead of the traditional split screen. How about the move I well, damn, I know some won't like me for this, but I'm gonna remove a sin for that. I like the way Charlotte flipped through the double suplex attempt right into the double chop block. Smart move. Oh my god! What? Asuka landed too early from the natural selection. We were actually starting to do well, and then that happened. Charlotte flares, I'm not the champion, but that's a legal face. Charlotte must have taken one shot to the head too many. She looks up and believes that Rhea Ripley is actually the WrestleMania sign, so she starts pointing. Previously on WWE. Ladies and gentlemen, coming up next is the WWE Championship match between Bobby Lashley, Braun Strowman, and Drew McIntyre. Sick! It's not gonna happen for another two hours. You just got fooled into thinking what's up next. <laughs> I mean, you did kind of run from him on Monday. At a time where tag teams are severely lacking in WWE, we present to you another possible foreshadowing of The Miz splitting up from John Morrison. And shockingly, wouldn't be the first time they did that either. The fact that Dominic Mysterio actually fell for Robert Roode and Dolph Ziggler's plan of attack. If I were Dominic, I would have instantly started throwing fists. Knowing full well I was going to get my ass kicked anyway. Might as well go down swinging. I don't mean to sound, no pun intended, rude here, but when I look at Robert and Dolph, the first thing that doesn't come into my head is Dirty Dogs. Like, where did that name come from other than a wheel of random names? 127 days. And we're only mentioning the amount of days they've held the titles because we're trying to spoil the fact that this is going to be their last day as champions. We're dicks. And Rey Mysterio goes right up. The referee rings the bell to start this match before Robert or Dolph could figure out who's going to start. Yes, a big part of it was Rey Mysterio going after them, but it looks like both Robert and Dolph are allowed to compete at once. With a split baseball slide, slide. Split baseball slide slide splash. Boy, that certainly is a mouthful to say. Michael Cole is starting to lose it on commentary at this point, isn't he? Despite the announcement of the SmackDown Tag Team Championships being on the line by the ring announcer, commentators, and graphics, WWE felt the need to give yet another reminder that the tag team titles are on the line five minutes into the match. Champions, this isn't a charity bit. I get that Rey Mysterio is out number two to one, but even Dolph Ziggler should know better than to count out one of the greatest legends in WWE history, right? Right? Mysterio says Bobby Roode. His name is Robert Roode, you dumbass. Yeah, yeah, everyone knows him more as Bobby Roode, but the official records say that's not his ring name. Embarrassed Dolph the past couple of weeks. All Robert and Dolph do in this match is taunt Rey Mysterio to the point where they absolutely deserve to lose the match. Good heel work, but it's not helping my boredom. Oh, and Dolph Ziggler going. Dolph Ziggler hit that DDT on Rey's leg so hard that he got mad at the ringside mats. Bad mats. Very bad. Here are three more sins added to the counter. The fact that Dolph believes he has enough time to tie up his hair in the middle of a title match really makes me anxious. I speak for the entire WWE universe. No, you don't. Me. Dolph Ziggler hits the ring post, but for whatever reason, the sound heard is completely off sync from the moment Dolph hit it. I get that Dominic Mysterio is still injured, but I'd appreciate it if he didn't wait over 10 minutes before showing up. The last 10 minutes have not been that good. Also, WWE dragged this tag team title match too long. After about 10 minutes of Ray getting taunted and beaten down in a two-on-one scenario, Dominic shows up to make the heroic save, only to take more damage and keep the dragon going on for nearly another 10 minutes. Back to his feet, zigzags, kick out by... Oh, that's just bullshit. Dolph Ziggler connects the zigzag, a move that won him so many championships over the years, and Ray kicks out of it like it wasn't even that devastating. Sucks that finishers don't seem to exist anymore. Tag made, here comes Dominic. Don't tag Ray Mysterio was shocked that Dominic tagged himself in, despite the fact that he was clearly shown reaching out to Dominic prior to any of this. Buster. Well, so much for that hot tag moment we normally see. That sure as hell didn't last. Time to continue dragging this match on, so here are five more sins. The counter is climbing pretty high in the early goings, am I right? I don't get it. If both Robert Roode and Dolph Ziggler know how to counter nearly every hot tag moment in this match, how the fuck do they end up losing their titles? They're a smart tag team, if I'm being perfectly honest. You have got to be kidding me. Oh no, please don't tell me that heel Michael Cole is starting to rise from the ashes again. Somebody quick, put him away before he rises again. Yes, I know that this was all done to reveal the zombies from Army of the Dead, but really? Lumberjacks get their own locker room? Do they do this for every time a Lumberjack match is scheduled for the night? If the intention of the zombies are to eventually attack and devour both The Miz and John Morrison, why don't they attack and eat John right now? Like he's literally right there and zombies have no conscience. This is not how zombies work. Also, I'm just gonna go ahead and throw in 15 additional sins for WWE believe in adding zombies to the mix on a pay-per-view not relating to Halloween or anything horror related was a good idea. WWE once promoted Star Wars movies, why didn't Kylo Ren make a cameo or something? And no, I'm not talking about Alexa Bliss throwing temper tantrums. Oh, the memories of 2017. Apparently, Jimmy Uso entering Roman Reigns' room requires a cameraman to zoom in on his shirt for no reason. 
Let's just go ahead and take a sin off for Jimmy Uso's creativity on the Nobody's Bitch shirt. I'd love to purchase that. Is this another one of your weird new age? In some ways, I can understand the Miz's skepticism from John Morrison trying to warn him about the zombie lumberjacks, because let's face it, nobody would ever believe something like this happened on WWE pay-per-view. Spoiler alert, Batista's not even friends with any of the zombies in that movie, nor did his character orchestrate how the zombies operate. So this tweet makes absolutely no sense. Army of the dead. Skip! And I'm not just talking about the advertisement. Skip this match too. What? I can't skip it? I have to relive it? Fuck this job! Guys, 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 there was a zombie underneath the commentator's desk this entire time and somehow none of them realized it until now? Last I checked, zombies don't supernaturally appear out of thin air. Another five cents because WWE doesn't know how zombies work. Zombies would never pose as lumberjacks to keep wrestlers in the ring. They would actually jump in the ring and attack the wrestlers without a second or even a first thought. God, this whole thing is just pissing me off to the point where I'm bringing out a familiar object to my fans. All right. What's honestly stopping the zombies from grabbing Damian Priest's leg and eating him? I can't believe I would ever say this on the WWE Sins. But if you're gonna eat him, FUCKING EAT HIM ALREADY! No one cares what's trending. Can the zombies somehow eat Twitter, please? That's not the Miz! Oh. Even with the camera change, you can clearly tell that Damian Priest missed the Miz completely in that spinning heel kick from the top rope. In a wrestling match promoting a zombie movie, we interrupt WrestleMania Backlash to bring you Star Wars The Last Jedi. Man, everything is sucking now. They're coming to get you, Johnny! Oh. The only good thing about this match is John Morrison using his parkour against the zombies, simply because it's awesome to watch John Morrison perform his parkour routines. Unless The Miz is also supernatural like The Fiend or The Undertaker, him coming back from a zombie attack is the most unrealistic thing I've seen around here in a long time. Even with you in his corner, Roman might lose the title! Boy, that statement did not age well after the next hour and a half, am I right? Roman Reigns and his bitch. Well, holy shit, that sick burn from Jimmy Uso has taken five sins off the counter. Though that won't do much for the thousands of sins that are already on it. Uh-oh, Michael Cole forgot to add in 80 to the amount of days that Bailey has been the SmackDown Women's Champion. He better hightail it out of here before Bailey starts running after him in anger once again. You just can't let me be champion, can you? <laughs> what the fuck? Bianca Belair actually expected wrestlers to simply let her be SmackDown Women's Champion? Well, she's new to the title scene, but I'm pretty sure even she knows that once you win a title, you do not get any time to yourself as champion. Once you're champion, you're the target. She's looking to get her championship back tonight. Wow, Pat, you, just like a lot of commentators before you, are a real Sherlock Holmes. Impressive on your discovery. Bell Loser shaved into her head. Apparently, Bailey has Bell Loser shaved into the back of her head tonight, something we instantly forget about because the rest of Bailey's hair is covering it up. If it ain't gonna be visible, there's really no point in doing that. Army of the Dead. Stop reminding me of what just happened, you absolute dumbass. Uh, Michael, that's not shave. Those words are clearly drawn into Bailey's head. You may want to take another look before the rest of her hair covers it up. <laughs> Bailey heard that WWE is going back on the road with fans in attendance and automatically assumed that it was going to be tonight. Nope, we're still in the Thunderdome. We still got a couple of months before the fans get back in the arenas. And Belair with her first title defense. That's like the second or third time that Michael Cole has announced this being Bianca Belair's first title defense since winning at WrestleMania. What does Bianca have to do to retain? Um, maybe pin Bailey or make her submit. You know, something she is known to be doing. Same thing with every champion who's ever competed. We know touch my hair. No disrespect to Bianca Belair not wanting her hair to be touched, but when you got a braid as long as hers, it's next to impossible to not touch the hair. I believe she's saying kiss my ass. Pat McAfee is trying to perform his own version of Sherlock Holmes as much as possible just so Michael Cole wouldn't be too noticeable when he does it. Not working. Oh, Bailey, though, grab the earring. I'm sorry, but if Bianca Belair wrestles with her earring still on, she's a complete idiot. That's just asking for someone to grab them and cause pain. I think they're cutting to as many shots at the Thunderdome as they can, knowing full well these are the last few months of his existence. For now, hopefully not. Her up for the championship, almost stole one. Commentator stupidly refers to a roll-up as steal of the victory cliche. Surprised I didn't say that in recent Sins videos. But just when I thought I was free from it, there it is. <laughs> Whatever the fuck that was supposed to be. The championship is Belair! Bailey hit the camera so hard it activated the circle surrounding the action in dramatic fashion special effect. About one minute of Bailey smiling, walking around, laughing, taunting, pretty much doing anything except continue the offense of Bianca Belair, who recovers from all of this and wins. The end. Belair, right infringement. Fired up. And 
wow, there were a lot more botches in this match than I remember from the first time I watched it. Took a deep breath, relax, slow the pace. In other words, Bianca Belair did everything she should not be doing if she wants to retain the SmackDown Women's Championship. Maybe Sasha Banks had a point on the rookie taunts. Get Belair up, got the ropes a second time. It's not illegal if you don't get caught. Bailey put her hands on the ropes to gain leverage on the pinfall and got busted by the referee. Pat McAfee's way of defending Bailey's actions is saying the not illegal if you don't get caught phrase, which doesn't work because Bailey got caught. While it was Bianca Belair's intention to cheat by using her hair for leverage in the pinfall, unfortunately, the braid slipped off of Bailey's leg, which allowed Bailey to kick out in time before the three count. One controversial thing turned into another. He is the almighty. No disrespect to MVP, he's a great talker on the microphone, but he's literally repeating what we've already known for months about Bobby Lashley being the almighty WWE champion. Tell us something we don't know. WWE only added Braun Strowman to the mix just so Bobby Lashley could have a one-on-one -on -one match with Drew McIntyre at Hell in a Cell, and fans wouldn't be questioning why Drew is getting so many one-on-one -on -one opportunities. Wait, they're already doing that! Drew McIntyre once again had poor timing on his entrance, realizing that he had entered a little too early and had to awkwardly stand on the stage waiting for the right moment in his music to hit so he could plunge the sword into the ground. Stop doubting my power! Don't worry, Corey. From the moment Bobby Lashley returned to WWE in 2018, I have never dull doubted his power. Has anyone in the comments dull doubted Bobby Lashley's power? If so, shame. Seth Rollins cashed in money in the bank at WrestleMania. And then Vert trying to sound like a wrestling nerd in an effort to conceal his poor commentary. Sorry, but it ain't working. Wow, big shocker. Two participants in a match involving Braun Strowman wanted to try and team up against him. Also, this shot makes me laugh. Bobby Lashley may refer to himself as the almighty WWE champion, but the almighty champion is literally the shortest guy in the match. Strange bedfellows in a Braun Strowman clearly missed Bobby Lashley with that kick, but somehow Bobby was affected by the non-impact. Down Strowman! Whoa. Bobby Lashley tried to start the monologue in, but Drew McIntyre immediately brushed it off to do some damage. Kudos to any wrestler for doing that. Good work on the part of Bobby Lashley and Drew McIntyre for lifting Braun Strowman in the air like that, but also major props to Braun on the way he balances himself in midair like that. Triple cooperation, triple center mover. We might need to rebuild the Thunderdome. This is shockingly not the first time Corey Graves said that. And seriously, I highly doubt that these three guys are going to literally destroy the Thunderdome to the point of reconstruction being required. Knee to the body of the oh, oh, oh. Well, holy shit, that was an amazing flip from Braun Strowman. You don't often see that sort of athleticism from someone his size. How in the ever-loving fuck did WWE not have any plans for this guy after seeing that? Set on the WWE champion. Champion with the I can't be the only one who thought for a second that Drew McIntyre was about to pull in AJ Styles and leap onto the ropes with a phenomenal forearm, right? I mean, come on, the way he got thrown over the top rope, caught himself on the apron, then jumped up and hit a forearm to back his opponent away. Wrecked by the steel ring. Take that, Stairs! I am your master now! It's hard, the master really poor timing on the replay as Drew McIntyre kicked Braun Strowman over the barricade and the live feed failed to capture a good shot of it. Considering the ramp is moving upwards, I highly doubt that suplex impacted Drew McIntyre that much. Now, if Bobby Lashley hit the suplex in the other direction... Oh! We interrupt WrestleMania Backlash to bring you that one edition of Raw when Braun Strowman and Bobby Lashley collided with the LED wall and destroyed the whole set. Man, 2019 was so much fun. Bobby has been taken out of the equation by crashing through electrical panels. So why is Drew McIntyre standing around yelling at the ceiling instead of heading back to the ring to focus on Braun Strowman? Get back in that fucking ring! A hungry. Yeah, go for a fun little slide down the ramp with no pain added to the mix whatsoever. That'll definitely show you I mean business. Look out, fellas! Braun Strowman is an absolute star in this match. He may not have won, but he put on one of his best performances in this WWE Championship match. It's as if he knew what was coming for his future and he chose to go down in memorable glory. I'm gonna miss this guy. Vince McMahon hears those words and accidentally assumed Braun Strowman meant he was finished with his WWE contract and chose to release him. Boy, this has to look really awkward. Over 10 years of being used to the Hell in a Cell pay-per-view taking place in October, and now it's randomly happening in June because... reasons. Also, there were literally three Hell in a Cell matches at the previous pay-per-view nearly eight months ago. Depending on if there's going to be two or three Cell matches at this next pay-per-view, that means we'll have seen a maximum of six Hell in a Cell matches in a one-year period. And that is definitely overusing the damn concept. As mentioned before, the main event of WrestleMania Backlash is a match that had absolutely nothing to do with the events of WrestleMania itself. And thus, this is stupid. It's a great match, though. Ooh, 
Now that I think about it, the video package for this main event match involving Roman Reigns and Cesaro spends a shitload of time focusing on Jimmy and Jey Uso, who don't even show up in any form tonight. This video package can't even get it right. World Championship matches don't come around. Unless you're Cesaro's opponent and Brock Lesnar. And of course, you know I can't resist taking out five sins for this absolutely epic new theme song for Roman Reigns. Really solidifies him as the final boss of WWE and the perfect bad guy. Main evented a half a dozen WrestleManias. Roman Reigns has only been in the main event of five WrestleMania events, not six. Or did WrestleMania take place in Appleton at some point in the COVID-19 pandemic and we never knew about it due to no one being in attendance? Doing another man inside a four Oh boy, is D-Generation X in the production truck again? Though what are the odds Pat McAfee's microphone was cutting off because he was going way off topic to what was going on in the ring? And can't quite get him up. Is it because of the bad arm? Not quite. Roman Reigns was clearly resisting Cesaro's attempt to lift him up. The bad arm comes into play later, but not at this moment. Forearm in the face and Cesaro's got a kick at one. Actually, there wasn't even a pinfall going on at all because the referee noticed Cesaro's shoulder was off the canvas. Not a one count at all, Michael. Cesaro lives and breathes this. It's all he wants to do. Wrestler lives and breathes being a wrestler because it's all they want to do, cliche. I'm just saying, it's not that impressive when literally everybody has the same mentality. Those who don't live and breathe wrestling don't wrestle. Smart move on the part of Cesaro to keep his grip on Roman Reigns' leg after Roman kicked out, but not so smart when Cesaro just stays there waiting for Roman to counter his next move. You gotta bury him when you can! Well, I guess the keyboard warriors on Twitter aren't the only ones overusing the term buried in professional wrestling. Please stop using that word, guys. Personal title. Shoulders are no Surprisingly not the first awkward pinfall due to the shoulders being up the entire time in this match. Roman Reigns wasting time taunting Daniel Bryan, who, by this point, isn't even signed with a damn company anymore. Using the bad arm. Unintentional shout out to Dean Ambrose by performing a variation of Dean's rope flip trick. Oh, the good old days. You understand me? Roman indeed has got a lot of responsibilities. Unfortunately, one of them doesn't seem to be make sure you don't waste time by monologuing during your match because it's a shitty rookie mistake. I'm trying to enjoy this match. I really am. But in this shot, all I can look at is Paul Heyman being a creepy asshole while video bombing. He really needs to stop doing that. Can Cesaro cap the reins up and he does! It's amazing that Cesaro can do that, period. But doing that with an injured arm is even more impressive, even if it only caused him more pain. So I'll take one sin off of that superplex, and another one because Cesaro actually does the one thing most wrestlers seem to ignore. SELLING INJURIES! Cesaro off the second rope! And that was an awesome Superman punch in midair, perfectly timed and well executed. Loving this match. Shoulders down. Here's another sign off for the way Roman stayed in the match. Extremely exhausted and knew he had no strength to kick out, so he slowly got his shoulder in the air to stop the count. When you pay attention to every small detail, you're telling a great story. I really admire the final moment of this match. Cesaro is trapped in the guillotine and has no way of escaping, yet he fights through the pain of his bad arm for one last chance to get out. But in the end, it was too much for him to handle when he passes out. Fighting to his last breath. That is why this match was one of the best in recent memory. Take notes, wrestlers who've refused to do any of this just so they could do annoying gymnastics in their matches. Post-match assault. Also, I'll finish off with one final sin removal, because at least Jey Uso and Seth Rollins waited until after the match was over to perform their subsequent attacks. Did not ruin that absolute classic at all. 